Hello everyone. Today uh, we will be talking about fast convergence and the effect from design point of view when we have fast converge network, when we especially tune some timers, etc. Uh, this will be another service provider uh, network discussion and uh, we will talk not only fast convergence but other things as well from design aspect, mainly fast convergence we want to focus on. And my name is Orhan Ergun, with me Mohamed Radwan here, and uh, welcome Mohamed. Hi Orhan, uh, nice to have a second session with you. It's nice to have you too. So, uh, well, let's jump in, what we will talk, uh, let's, let's basically clarify. Yeah, so um, today we will talk uh, about another uh, service provider project, and maybe in the future we can cover uh, some enterprises so to make sure that uh, we fulfill the needs for multiple audience. So, uh, as you can see, you, as you will know, uh, that uh, fast convergence is becoming one of the main pillars of each uh, service provider project. So that's why, uh, for me, fast convergence has been, I did it uh, many times since I started. And each and every service provider, either it's a green field or uh, it's doing some enhancement. Usually, they consider fast convergence as one of the main services they want to make sure it's working as per perfectly. So here, uh, as you can see, the main challenge is that we have fast conversion for a service provider. It was supporting mobile, as you can see. So it has some uh, uh, RAM and uh, 3G, 4G terminated into the, some of the aggregation routers. And in addition to that, it serves some uh, customers, some business customers like again layer three, and provide internet services for the mobile and the fixed broadband. So we'll provide the internet for MBB and FBB. Another point that we have multiple vendors. So as example for the service layer, we had some uh, F5 working as a CGNet and load balancer. We have some checkpoints. Firewalls, okay. Okay. And at even this, for this, at uh, this moment, PEs, not all of them were Cisco. So we have multiple vendors. We have Cisco and Juniper. So Let's, we, once we started Mohammed, the journey, we would see how we thought about the design and what were some of the challenges we considered for this uh, big service provider. Can you hear me, Mohammed? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can now. Let me uh, clarify a couple points so far. RAN stands for Radio Access Network, MBB Mobile Broadband, FBB Fixed Broadband, CGNet, Service Layer CGNet, it says, CGNet Carrier Grade NET. Some of you might know as LSN, Large Scale NET. And uh, these mm -hmm. are the terminology DC, of course, uh, data center, etc. So uh, we are uh, moving. Also, what we are seeing, egg aggregation network generally service providers like uh, we call access network then aggregation sometimes depends on the scale we might have pre-aggregation so uh, aggregation after aggregation core network the core, for the core you might hear as backbone etc so uh, this is what we are talking at the moment guys let's continue on it Exactly. So, as you can see, uh, here in this service provider, they have multiple services. So, they have mobile, they have internet, they have some business customers, and they have also video. In addition, that also, they have the normal network control, network management, and they serve their retail office because retail stores because you know they are mobile operators so also they want to sell the retail provide them access to their data center and provide them access to the internet so they have a lot of services each of these services come with its own uh, requirement um, as we are aware that mainly for voice uh, which include voice real time and mobile that we need to make sure that for example uh, the delay is 150 milliseconds. So, in case of failure, they were looking for trying to reconvert in top uh, 200 milliseconds. And for other services, for example, uh, like video, the set a limit that we need to converge under one second, okay, as a convergence. For internet, there was no, it was mainly best effort. So, uh, we didn't have a solid uh, 
KPI or SLA to meet for this service provider. So that's why when we start thinking about a solution uh, to meet this, we, we try to think about all the layer which we need to address. I'll come back again to this slide. But let me, can you see this next slide? Yes. So, yeah, when I start thinking about how to make sure that uh, to me this uh, SLA and converge under subsecond, I, I start thinking about I need to make sure that the convergence is happening into these multiple layers because sometimes these layers depend on each other. So, as we all know, as example, usually uh, the IGP will converge after detecting a failure from the physical layer. Then, based on that, BGP will uh, converge, and and then the application using the BGP will uh, converge after the BGP is converging. So when we start thinking about this convergence, we need to consider the relation between the multiple layers. Okay, one second. So while you are arranging, let me uh, clarify a couple points. For, for the voice, yeah. Uh, 150 millisecond moment said general accepted uh, best practice for the voice uh, 150 yeah. millisecond one-way latency not RTT and for that one way you may not remember what was it one way two ways etc just maybe remember it's we also call it because mouth to ear latency mouth to ear latency for voice 150 milliseconds and for this network from the customer what Mohammed say from the customer the requirement for the video traffic was uh, less than a second less than one second convergence time since we are going to talk about fast convergence so we need to know the uh, parameters numbers here for the applications critical applications their services in fact like um, uh, as we said mobile service internet there business, VPNs, etc. Video, video, is it IPTV uh, plus something? Or what type of video? It was mainly IPTV. There was no uh, video on demand. It was mainly IPTV. So it's streaming. That's why the limit wasn't high. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, uh, as you mentioned, so now the pen is working. So once we start thinking about the design itself, I will show you what we did in each layer. But what I need you to, to make sure that these layers are related somehow. So what happened in one layer actually affect the second one. So that's why you need to make sure how fast you are in convergence. And maybe for some protocol, they need to wait for other protocols to converge before sending the traffic. So as example, usually for IGP, you need to wait for BGP before sending this label. Another point, a very important point I want to highlight is uh, what are the steps to converge? So let's say, let me, I want to, let me say, I want to get rid of this. Um, Maybe we can clean also this. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, I'll clean the screen and come back. <laughs> Meanwhile, let me talk something then. Uh, so we will be showing now convergence steps. Uh, usually we mention about four steps. So uh, those are the first one should be detection of the failure. Failure can be link failure, node failures or device routers, etc. Failure. SRLG failure, shared risk link group, we call it, right? So different type of failure might happen, local failure or also remote failure might be. But we will be generally talking when we talk about fast convergence or fast reroute. There are differences. I will mention also about uh, those differences in this uh, recording. So detection is the first step. And we will be talking about different mechanisms for detecting the failure, different type of failure. BFD, of course, will, will be just one of them. BFD, people are thinking that it is the convergence uh, mechanism. No, BFD is just one of the steps in overall convergence. So uh, BFD stands for bidirection forwarding detection, phase failure mechanism. So phase failure detection mechanism, sorry. And then after that, we will see propagation when there is a failure. The local node attached to the failure needs to inform its neighbors and entire network needs to inform, needs to be informed. And uh, after that, when the device receives 
uh, this new information they need to find an alternate path and this alternate path needs to be signal into the ribbon fib update is basically control and data plane update now uh, Muhammad will mention these steps and we will yeah. deep dive by the way the which IGP we have in this network we have uh, ISIS okay we have ISIS here in the network so yeah let me uh, re repeat again so yes yeah, thank you beforehand so this is very important and for your life and when you design fast convergent you need to be aware of these four steps and you need to find the right tool to enhance each of these steps. So let's say if I let's say let's say a failure happened here on this second second T zero the failure happened. So I need some time to detect the failure. It will take me to T one. Then I need to inform my neighbor I have this failure. After that, I need to find or process an event, which means I need to find an alternate route or alternate path, which will, then I will finish by T3. And finally, I need to update my routing information base and forwarding information base with this new path. So this will end up in T4. So let's say for the old date, it may be the detection take three seconds. And then the propagation take maybe 10 seconds and finding an alternate route take us up to five seconds and finally updating is one second. So this means for me, after detecting the failure, it took me around 19 seconds to converge. So for the old days, I remember in the late 90s and early 2000s, this was very acceptable, especially in IP network where we mainly used for uh, uh, campus mainly used for data and uh, internet, so this was for, uh, very uh, adequate and sufficient. But with uh, with a converged network, because as you remember, we have mobile calls, we have uh, video, we have very important business customer. So in this case, we need to converge in this than uh, a second. So in sure. order to converge in this than a second, I need to make sure that these four times will be as fast as possible. Okay, okay? Mohammed. So, uh, this uh, yeah. 19 seconds is not the real time, right? We are just making up. No, no, just like the exact, just an example. Yeah, yeah, just a giving them, just to make it easy to uh, to do the math. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but the propagation delay for the propagation, uh, you said 10 seconds would be too much, by the way, for real life. Even probably back in all yeah, days, yeah. 10 seconds. Yeah, yeah, so agree. here for yeah. um, two timers, they generally uh, today uh, are high compared to others. Detection time can can take a uh, help of time if you are not utilizing some uh, special mechanisms like physical layer down detection or BFT etc. And update, so uh, update refib update control data plane uh, update for the new information. Otherwise propagation uh, generally depends on couple parameters. One is sterilization latency, what is your link capacity, and other is uh, distance physical distance propagation latency we call it. And every thousand kilometers at five sec five millisecond uh, there. So and step three, by the way, if you are running ISAS in this network, we are running ISAS. If it would, could be OSPF as well, it is SPF. SPF will run and will find an alternate path for us. Let's continue. Yeah, but just to highlight some point here, uh, Oran. When we talk about the propagation step number two, mm -hmm. uh, I don't I don't mean the time it will take to send the packet uh, on the wire, to put the packet on, on the wire and to reach the neighbor. Uh, from some some old routers, as example, to make the network stable, if the router detect a failure here in this T1, that some of the devices used to have something like a backup algorithm that I will wait, maybe this link has, has been flapping, so I will not inform my neighbor directly about the failure, maybe I will wait one second, uh, 500 milliseconds and so on, then I will send an LSA or LSP in case of ISS informing my neighbor that there was a, a failure. So that's what I meant about this uh, propagation of the event. You need to be how uh, then we can have this trade off. Shall I be, send it immediately after I see it? Or shall I implement something like a throttling algorithm to make sure the network is stable? Not whenever I see each 
failure, I will send it directly, but maybe for the first one, I will be very fast, but then I will start doing some back off for the next one. This back off, what I, by the way, uh, the Mohammed mentioned, is also uh, in other protocols like OSPF as well, and uh, we call it exponential back off. So basically, yeah. it's uh, similar to IP event dampening mechanisms uh, or BGP. Uh, basically, when I see the first packet, I will uh, generate the update as soon as possible if it's uh, not zero. And then, uh, if there is flap or somehow brownout in the network, so I will uh, postpone the uh, subsequent SPF runs. So I will not run immediately SPF again. Maybe there is a flap in the network, so I don't want to consume uh, more device resources. Yeah, excellent. Exactly, yeah, great, thank you. Bro. So let's say, so these are the four steps. Let's go to the next slide and see for each step what we have done so yeah. far. Yeah. Um, uh, let me erase all drawings. Okay. So here, can you see my screen now? Yes, but uh, still the, the conversion step slide I'm seeing. Oh, really? Yeah. You don't see the table? Or Not yet. Okay. Uh, I think it's coming. At the moment, blank. Yes, Stop. it just came, but then now gone. Yes. Okay now? Yes. Okay. So let's see. Remember this layer we talked about mm -hmm. that we try to enhance. So I will I will try to categorize what we have done into layers and then we take about each of these features is it fall under detection or propagation or so on. Well, for physical layer, which also apply to the ISIS, because when we detect the physical, we detect it into the IGP. So usually we have a couple of things to do here. So from detection perspective, uh, this is something we inherited from the old days, from uh, SDH and ATM. We, we used to have, if you have maybe two ATM switches or two DWDM boxes, and there's a link between them, and maybe your device is connected as IP here, directly or point to point. So we have what we call it carrier delay, which carry your signal, like a wavelength and so on. So when a device, when a port here detects a failure on the link, usually we had to configure this carrier delay that once you detect this failure, don't send this notification to the upper layer immediately, but just wait maybe for, at that time it was very common to wait for two seconds in the physical layer before informing the IGP that I have a failure into my uh, optical or electrical, mainly optical beams. So this was not uh, acceptable anymore and in most of the new implementation, everybody is recommending to set this carrier delay at zero, especially in the downtime. So carrier delay will have two notifications. When the link goes down, it will raise a notification. And when the, when the link comes back up, it will also tell another notification to the up, uh, upper layer. So in this project, what we decided to do, when the link fails, I need to inform ISIS immediately about the failure, so that's why I will make the carrier delay zero millisecond, I will not wait at all. But when the links come back up, I just need to wait a bit to make sure it's not lapping, to make, to wait, to make sure that everything is okay. And because when the failure happened, I already have a backup route, so no need to be a, a hurry and inform the upper layer about the up state immediately. So that's why we decided to put it as 10 seconds. Another important uh, tool which we use for detection, which is BFD, would, which would be very important in case if I have, as example, a switch in the middle between my two routers, so they don't have a direct notification if a link failure into the remote side. So you can configure this BFD session between these two neighbors. Uh, and BFD is a very light protocol, and as I mentioned, for our case, we have some core devices as a Cisco. 
and some of the PEs were, were Juniper. So in this case, depend on the device, depend on the hardware and the iOS version, you need to agree uh, with the interoperability testing and to make sure you are not uh, uh, putting something not supported by the other vendor. So in this case, we decided within the core, we will have DFD configured as 100 milliseconds per keep alive. And after three failed uh, failures, uh, after, uh, sorry, it was uh, 100 milliseconds uh, in the core and 300 milliseconds on the edge. Okay. And the last point that when we have an interface uh, failure, we will implement something like dampening. Like when, whenever each failure will happen, I will have a penalty. And then if the failure happen again, I will have a penalty. Then we, we will wait some time to reuse this interface. But we decided not to use this uh, feature into BGP because now it's, uh, as, we, as, we, as we know, it's not something good practice to have dampening for BGP. Let, let me make it clear, clear, basically, for the audience later on, they might think why they are yeah. saying this. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah. there are some work also done, uh, some real life, life testing by RIPE and uh, one of my articles you can find on that I am mentioning which actually RIPE uh, paper is defining this uh, if you type uh, Orhanergen BGP pet hunting so BGP pet hunting basically the convergence process of uh, BGP and pet hunting is the behavior of generally pet vector protocol and distance vector protocol like AIGRP as well you need to hunt the pet when there is a failure uh, we need to basically uh, go through this process and uh, when we do the event dampening for BGP um, the possible possible uh, problem for penalized prefix can be too much than your expectation so what I'm saying you might be expecting this prefix to be penalized in let's say one minute but suddenly, because of patenting process of BGP, you might see 30 minutes uh, of this prefix to disappear from the global internet, for example, default free zone, DFZ. So, which means, let's say you are penalizing uh, and you don't advertise to your upstream some prefix to a two BGP uh, dampening, you, you said, I will not send this prefix to my upstream for one minute if five five times uh, if I see this prefix flapping huh? but then suddenly you are uh, you are removing this prefix from global routing table maybe 30 minutes as I said uh, there are some real life work on that done by RIPE and uh, their recommendation also uh, I am sharing in the article if you check Orhanarian BGP pet hunting on Google you will find a link for that so for the uh, so far what I understand uh, what you did is both career delay and the BFT on the same interfaces you enabled one correct? Yeah, okay. let me go back to the, the drawing again. Uh -huh. As you can see, here we have multiple layers. So NPE, UP, by the way, also we are seeing it in yeah. left. P stands for providers, yeah. NPE, network PE, UP, user PE. NPE generally we yeah. connect the network devices, our infrastructure devices, and user termination, like business customer, for example, is terminated on the UP guys in service provider networks. Okay. Yeah, so as I mentioned, here you have multiple layers. So. BFD timers was configured differently depending on the uh, support of the uh, other devices. So as I mentioned, inside the core, because it was supporting uh, BFD, so we went very aggressive in some places. We went to uh, 15 milliseconds as a keep alive, so we converted in 45 milliseconds. In other places, we uh, depended on a server, we put it at 100 milliseconds. If the device support. When we are peering with the uh, service layer, as you know that maybe the F5 was doing the CGNet and then sending the traffic back 
to the device, to the internet gateway, okay, and send it to the internet. So we have a BGP session between the router, the aggregation router, which is receiving the internet traffic from the user, and uh, the F5, which will take this uh, traffic and do the carrier grade net and then send it to the internet gateway. So the F5, in order to do that, we have this BGP session. So and we need to make sure that the BGP will converge as fast as possible. So we have to uh, enable some this uh, DFD and to support it only as three milliseconds. This also applies to some of the uh, Juniper devices, which was there in the network. Uh, some some of, some of them were a bit old devices with an old uh, three milliseconds or three seconds. You are you mean? Sorry. You said three milliseconds. You mean three seconds, right? Three, three, two, 300 milliseconds. So 300 milliseconds, okay. Yeah. So this was, as I mentioned, uh, what we did for uh, BFD and carrier delay. Let's okay. Go. I have a question on this one. You said uh, on the core devices, core, core interfaces, uh, BFD uh, was 50 milliseconds and 3 keep alive. So uh, was it stable after that? Yeah, so as I mentioned, it was only between the core, mm -hmm. and uh, this core uh, device was uh, able to support that. Some of them was uh, CRS, uh, Cisco CRS, so it was capable of uh, doing that. And for other, where we peering with other devices, which is not capable of doing this very aggressive timers, we put it up to 100 uh, milliseconds. Okay? Okay, in the core, so up to 100 milliseconds, at the edge, up to 300 milliseconds. Yeah, in the, in the core, we have two, to have two cases. If it's within the core, all the devices CRS was 15 milliseconds. Between the core and some of the MPE, 100 milliseconds. And toward the edge was 300 milliseconds. Okay, so far uh, we understand these are BFT, uh, BFT bidirectional forwarding detection. Uh, which is used for fast failure detection, BFT timers. Okay, guys, not uh, overall end-to-end uh, -end conversions. For end-to-end -end conversions, we need those four steps. BFT is the first step. So we will understand at the end uh, what was the actual uh, conversions time when there is a core link failure, edge link failure, core node failure, edge node failure, etc. Exactly, exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so let me, let's go back to the table. Okay. Uh, when it's come to logical, we'll, we'll take it quickly because I watch the time. Uh, when it's come to logically, there are some recommendations, as example, uh, as you know, uh, the conversion Convergence in some protocol, it depends on number of prefix. That's why summarization will help a lot when we uh, looking for a fast conversion. Another point is bundling. If you have two physical interfaces and you want to uh, assure better convergence, instead of having a different uh, routing protocol instance running between these two devices, it would be better to have it in a bundle. So if I have router one and router two, and for kind of resiliency, I configure these two, uh, I have two links. So instead of configuring each link as a point to point and give an IP address here in this link and another uh, subnet here and uh, if link fails, the second link will take over, it would be better to configure these two links as a bundle and put all the logical configuration in the bundle itself. Uh, also, toward the end user, we need to make sure we have HSRP, uh, as a global for all the next protocol, we need to make sure that we are supporting, uh, if the device supports this non-stop routing, we have to enable it. If it doesn't, we can support uh, non-stop forwarding and uh, global and uh, graceful restart would be with us in both cases. So this was about the logical uh, enhancement, which we recommended. Uh, when it comes to ISIS, you have two options. Either to configure fast hello, for detection or rely on BFD. So the good thing about BFD, it's a very light protocol running, some people say it's running on layer one, layer two. 
and then, then it's sent its update to the upper protocol like ISIS and BGP and even uh, OSPF and a lot of project, uh, protocol can utilize this PFD. So in our case, we decided that uh, we will not use fast halos. ISIS will depend on BFD. Okay, Mohammed, at this uh, moment, let me ask one yeah. question. Uh, for non-stop yeah. forwarding, non-stop routing, did you uh, also enable NSF, NSR in the core or just edge? No, in the core as well, for sure. Why you did on the, especially NSF, non-stop forwarding in the core, you have multiple no, parallel we, link, definitely. Yeah, we enabled uh, NSR uh, in case of, because, you know, in, in, let me go to the drawing again. If you consider, If you consider uh, this drawing, actually uh, we have multiple sites, and each site we have a couple of uh, routers on this side. Okay, and most of the PE on the site are connected uh, to these two uh, routers on the side in a uh, square shape. Okay, so we wanted to make sure that uh, in case of and each one of them have multiple RP. Okay, so these two devices were working as example in case of one device failed. The second one and the second RP can take over without affecting the traffic. So within the core, we configure non-stop routing and we configure it also into in the edge. Yes, yes, non-stop routing, okay. But uh, I am seeing why you had non-stop forwarding NSF, although you ah, have multiple yeah. parallel link. Yeah, no, I mean, I meant, yeah, as I mentioned a uh, couple of minutes ago, if the device support NSR, like in the core, we only configure NSR. If the device doesn't support NSR, we configure NSF. And this is true for the core, uh, core as well as edge? You did like that? As well as edge, yeah. So yeah. We, basically yeah. we have uh, everywhere NSR if the device supports and uh, NSF yes. if... Okay, let's... Why do we clarify very fast? And uh, before we move on, there are two questions also that let's answer them. So the NSF, no. non-stop forwarding, so if there is a control plane uh, failure or maybe you are doing some maintenance, etc., forwarding doesn't stop. So, but uh, for this one, uh, basically we have a data plane redundancy and uh, non-stop routing also in case of, again, uh, generalized CPU problem, etc. You have, they say, control plane is uh, either you are maybe updating or it, there is a failure. For every each and every routing protocol or any packet, we have, of course, uh, redundant RP, redundant uh, control plane on the same box, and we are synchronizing all the states between the uh, control plane in, in case of NSF. NSF, you don't have to synchronize the states, etc. Uh, so, NSR in this uh, design basically they enabled uh, on core or the edge devices if it supports if not non-stop forwarding generally because non-stop forwarding NSF is not recommended much in the core because in the core of the network we generally have a lot of redundancy on the access network we we have still redundancy most of the time but the uh, access networks networks generally ring based topology core either very densely partial mesh or full mesh. The reason access network blast reduce is much less than con uh, core network, backbone network. What is blast reduce? In case of, let's say, problem in the core network, the effect uh, to the service, to customers, will be too much if there is a co core backbone failure and problem. But uh, access is not like that. Access is terminating very small number of uh, customer traffic compared to core, that's why blast reduce in the access network failure is less. Uh, that's why we don't uh, think about the redundancy in the access network not as core network, that's why uh, not much redundancy compared to core network in the access network. Uh, that's why, that's why, that's why, so why, they're always asking why. The core uh, excessive redundancy we see, and generally full mesh topologies we see in the core networks on the service providers, 
but access is the ring but if they have too much money or critical access sites let's say then hub and spoke you might see as well this is how real life work and uh, since you don't have much redundancy in the access nsf we generally uh, recommend there uh, if nsr capability you have it seems a lot of good money you have so NS nsr can be deployed too but in the core nsf uh, is not a good practice to have non-stop forwarding because anyway you have uh, either ECMP or uh, multiple parallel path maybe not ECMP but you can do maybe UCMP through the traffic engineering etc normally of course OSP FISS cannot do unequal cost multipath but uh, we are doing it most of the time with the help of traffic engineering so far many RSVP based traffic engineering but now we are starting to see segment tracking T as well and by the way, will be one of the our, another discussion will be based on segment routing with Mohamed. Uh, we didn't plan yet today, but uh, we will be talking about that one as well. Let's continue, Mohamed. Yeah, th thank you, Arane, for the explanation. There is something very important I want to highlight. Uh, again, when you configure your path convergence, let's see, a lot of people there is a debate in the field. For example, if I have two devices directly connected with a fiber. So we, here we have multiple, uh, I saw a question in the chat, if we have carrier delay, why we configure BFD? This is a, a big argument in the market, that why if I have a carrier delay and maybe a DWDM or direct connectivity, dot fiber, if a link fail, I will detect it very quickly. So most probably I will detect it less than 50 milliseconds, uh, even if the uh, BFD is configured, as an example, with 100 milliseconds. So most of service providers, they configure BFD has extra level of security in case of maybe UDLD, in case of one of the fiber is failed, in case of there is something wrong in the control, in the in the specific uh, optics, that's why the link failed, but the optics is not uh, sending this signal to the upper layer. So in most, I mean, we can configure multiple tools to help you to detect as fast as possible. You don't want to uh, leave it to bad luck or leave it to problem. Uh, or uh, bugs or so on. So you depend on the uh, loss of signal, which we call it loss in most of the optical links and the carrier delay. And in 20, 10% or 1% of the cases where maybe carrier delay will be a problem on the optical or the SFP, you rely on BFD. Okay, another point, that, that's why we have these different tools to use. Uh, a very important point, uh, yeah, Oran mentioned, it depends on your topology and uh, re resiliency. You decide uh, which tool you use. As, as we mentioned, we use NSR here, and maybe we use NSF on the uh, edge. Uh, another point, let's get back to uh, OSP, uh, sorry, and ISIS, and see what other tool which we used. Yeah. So, so here we use also uh, something called prefix priority. Uh, Mohammed, prefix priority? I cannot see yeah. that slide. I can still see this uh, previous one. Mm. You, I think, share at the moment table. Table is not seen on the screen. Yeah, yeah one second. <clears throat> Meanwhile, while you are opening that, another question 150 to 100 millisecond convergence is a standard or not? Usually, service providers yeah. are looking for less than 50 milliseconds. They don't look yeah. for less. Just let me answer. You can also add uh, your point. So, uh, so, 50 millisecond comes from the Sonnet STH days. So, there was uh, APS in Sonnet STH, automatic protection switching, which would provide in a ring topology 50 millisecond convergence time, actually, phase three route time, let's say, uh, because you have the another. Uh, uh, physical link, but APS was the hardware. What we are doing the, here, uh, we are doing the convergence in the layer three by doing some changes in the layer three. Don't forget the Sonnet STH APS was providing 50 milliseconds, and it's like a norm or target, let's say. But most of the applications in the uh, service provider and enterprises might be working well with the 150 milliseconds. Uh, either if it's HD video uh, or voice traffic, they are okay with that. 
though some providers might be looking for 50 milliseconds and as you can see their timers will provide us especially core in the core failure case uh, he just detected the failure within maximum 45 millisecond detection is taking the most amount of time by the way in the convergence steps okay don't forget we will see spf etc these are nothing in this today modern cpus uh, fib update it depends on the number of prefixes mostly again hardware if it's uh, powerful rip fib update will take a lot of time if you are doing summarization etc we are dealing with the less amount of prefix that's why also uh, this rip fib update control plane uh, and data plane update will be much much faster than a couple milliseconds we are talking about here uh, 50 milliseconds can be achieved and we will now continue to talking about the timers and the protocols mm -hmm. Mohammed, i still see the same same slide yeah, now it goes to the next slide, but yeah, what you explain is yeah, perfectly uh, right. And yes, we just, the number 50 milliseconds is just inherited, but um, some of the service provider I worked with recently, they understand that application can even cope for up to one second delay, even some mobile traffic. So uh, you don't need to stick to the 50 milliseconds, which we inherited from the optical and SDH day. But it depends on the application and uh, the SLA you sign with your end customers. Uh, let's talk about uh, something which would apply to the LSP and SPF. Uh, what we call it the throttling algorithm, which we I try to explain it here in a small drawing. That what we are trying to do in order to make sure we have a trade-off between how fast we, how fast and stable the network will react. So in case if I if I notice there is or detect a failure, shall I start working uh, there immediately, send this to my neighbor and start working on the SPF to find another path, or uh, shall I try to do some uh, changes? So here, as you can see, uh, as a back of algorithm, we decided, as example, in, if failure happened, that wait 50 milliseconds and do the first run, then for the second run, wait 100 milliseconds. For the third run, do it after 200 milliseconds, and so on, till you reach the maximum, which is five seconds, as example. By doing this, you are very fast in reacting to the first failure. Okay. Some people, even for the first failure, you will make it one millisecond, and the second 50, and so on. And at the same time, you are you you will make the network stable. You are not wasting resources. That if the link is flapping. Every few milliseconds or every few uh, uh, seconds, you don't need to keep running the SPF, and this may lead to a lot of micro loops and some packet drops. So that's why the first failure acts very fast, the second failure acts uh, a bit slower and starts go going slower and slower in an exponential way, as Orhan mentioned, to meet why you are doing this kind of algorithm. We are trying to do the right balance between being fast and being stable. So in summary, be fast in the first failure and start to go slower in the next one. And uh, so this is what uh, here go pro ahead. protocols generally call that pacing timers and uh, all all protocol ISS, OSPF, LDP, uh, BGP, etc. What does pacing mean? If I see the event, yeah, IBGP, EBGP, by the way, they do the same thing, of course. In IBGP case, we, we call it minimum route advertisement interval, etc. We, we wait. Why? Because I might be hearing the same event from multiple paths. Should, should I immediately run SPF? Or should I immediately generate new LSA, new LSP, and then send? Or a little bit wait and send? Huh? Same thing for BGP. Should I immediately run BGP best path selection to find the best path and then advertise that best path? There is a pacing timer. Uh, we are waiting. We are basically arranging these timers to stabilize. Yes, of course, we will reduce maybe if the application requirement is that. But while reducing, we need to make sure that we are not increasing our CPU and memory utilization, etc., etc. So right balance means that uh, stable as well as fast. And we will have the balance based on what? Based on our network, based on our rate of change, based on our hardware, based on our connectivity, is it full mesh, etc. So based on many things here, this balance, this uh, timers change, 
e, many things change. De depends on your network, that's why we say it depends on your network, because your network hardware is different, your network uh, flap rate is different, so the pressure to control plane, what you put, what I put, might be different, right? So, yeah, let's continue on. This prefix priority, yeah. I think we are talking about, yeah, the last one for ISIS is the prefix priority. At, or I mentioned this will give you a couple of few nanoseconds, even sometimes very less uh, milliseconds. That, for example, if you have in your ISIS, let's say, a couple of thousand of routes, 4,000, 5,000 routes, most, most of them are point to point and management and so on. And you have maybe around less than uh, 10 or 20 percent of these prefixes for loopback, which is the most critical. Uh, prefix to do. What you can do is you try to mark these critical uh, routes for the loopbacks as a high priority and all the other routes you can mark it as a medium and low. So in case once the ISA has found another alternate path and, and it's need to start updating the FIB with the next with the right next hop and the new next hop, it will start with these high priority prefix first. So this will give them a few nanosecond and maybe up to a couple of millisecond uh, better convergence because it, once you install this loop back, you will be able to establish the LSP and be able to carry the traffic which is, was labeled in our case. That's important, uh, this prefix priority. Uh, generally, we call this step as uh, golden prefixes. So those, uh, as Mohamed said, like for the IPv4 slash 32s or those loopbacks, etc., and the top level DNS, those kind of things. We have lots of point to point interface or infrastructure interfaces generally also we call it between two routers, you assign IP address to that interface between the router. You don't use, use that uh, interface almost for any reason. You don't use it for uh, SPF calculation. You don't, is, you, you don't use it for network monitoring, etc. You put that IP address. In fact, in ISAs, you don't have to put at all you don't have to assign any IP address on the interface for the point-to-point -point interface. So, by still you are carrying in link state database, you are still carrying and placing them in a rip fib update, so they delay the convergence time. What Mohamed said, we, we put later. Uh, in fact, some people are even, service providers, are removing those infrastructure prefixes from IGP at all. How? With ISAS, okay. it is called advertised passive only. With OSPF, it's called prefix suppression. So they remove it completely, point-to-point -point addresses. So golden prefixes, so which mean uh, which prefixes will be prioritized, loopbacks, uh, DNS, etc. generally they put. And then uh, for, for the point-to-point -point infrastructure address, either you you place them in a rip fib, up, a rip -fib uh, after uh, those golden prefixes or completely you remove by doing advertised possible only in ISAS or uh, prefix suppression in OSPF, okay? So we are going well. BGP, what did, did you do? BGP. Yeah. BGP, I want just to ask first, does anybody here still believe that uh, BGP is a slow converged protocol? Does it converge in minutes? Yeah, in uh, control plane, it is. Uh, it might be very slow, depends on many things. But yes, you will talk about data plane. Uh, you did something, it seems. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean... Uh, one of the things which make it very slow, it was a huge uh, hello timer, sometimes 60, minutes, 60 seconds and it's up to three minutes to converge. And we have this scanner that every one minute I just run to see uh, if my neighbor is up and running. So in order to improve BGP, there was a lot of event driven and a lot of feature introduced to BGP, which make it much more uh, faster. Specifically, we have next hop tracking to track your eBGP neighbor, and once you see the link fail, you just uh, flush all the uh, NLRI that you learned from this neighbor. We have fast external failover. Uh, we have some enhancement to the, we, the scanner idea was deleted, it was removed completely from BGP. So I don't, I, I don't wait every minute to go and check my uh, neighbor and check my uh, routing table and this update. I just wait. When, when my neighbor fail, I just react immediately. So all of this actually improved the BGP a lot. And uh, I saw in some uh, cases, uh, with not for uh, uh, BGP, I mean like not IP version 4 for the full routing table, but for 
some customers and for MVPGP with some specific business customer, we were able to convert in around a second for BGP between the PE and router PE. So this is a very good improvement for BGP. A second point I want to highlight, uh, which some people, they are not really, they are either neglected or they are not aware of it. Uh, BGP is uh, working on the TCP. It's a protocol number 172. So BGP minutes. consider an application, yeah, an application using TCP. So in order to enhance BGP, you need somehow to start working on enhancing your uh, TCP, uh, specifically in the devices where you have a lot of uh, peering, like the router vector. So uh, number, how to enhance the TCP uh, window slicing to give it the maximum number, as you can see here in the, draw, in the table, 65,000. Uh, 65, uh, you need to start, uh, now it's enabling most of the IOS XR and Cisco is a selected act. You don't need to act. Um, uh, the last uh, message you received, you just send back to the sender which uh, packet you didn't get, and it will just send this packet, not repeat everything from the one you lost. And a lot of enhancement to this TCP, which will improve the BGP. So just to summarize, uh, some feature like next up tracking, fast external failover, allow the BGP to converge very fast and to act as an event driven, not like just not like waiting, only waiting for the BGP membership to expire and then remove the routing information. Also, some enhancement to TCP in addition to the things which we did in ISIS, like also rely on BFD. BFD over bundle for BGP is supported in most of the new devices, uh, MSR, and also maybe for uh, within your network because you know that uh, uh, minimum advertisement uh, routing and server uh, it's different by default between eBGP and iBGP. So within your uh, network for uh, the, the neighborship with the router picture is also recommended to configure it to zero uh, because some of the devices this default is 30 milliseconds, 60 milliseconds, and so on. Okay, let me. Thank you. Yeah. Let me add a couple things here. Uh, for the what I see, a couple things there to talk. Uh, next stop tracking is a working mechanism. Mohamed mentioned about BGP scanner. BGP scanner is a process which we basically, before next stop tracking, also was there to find for the BGP to uh, find if there is a next stop failure or not, runs every 60 seconds, and uh, this is for every implementation same. Cisco Juniper, etc. So, but uh, with the next stop tracking, it's similar to BFT. When when I see B NHT, it's similar to uh, BFT. From if you if you would give analogy, why B BFT? All the protocols register to the BFT, and if BFT session goes down, protocols are informed. So that's why you don't have to tune if you have IGP, BGP, MPLS, lag, etc. In your network. Uh, aggressive timers on the control plane. No, you just set up the BFT session and the BFT light uh, data plane offload mechanism for phase failure detection. Then uh, basically BFT inform them. BFT inform its clients. Next stop tracking is the same thing. Next stop tracking, uh, what happens with the NHT is when there is a, let's say, next stop failure and this next stop is carried via IGP or ISAS. ISAS informs when you have next stop tracking, ISS informs that in case of uh, next stop failure about that uh, next stop failure to BGP process. So IGP is carrying your uh, next stop, right? So uh, either what, loopback interface or maybe out, outgoing interface. Uh, that interface is carried via IGP and when there is a failure, IGP informs the BGP uh, with the next stop tracking. So that's why we generally we also say BGP convergence, even if you do BGP prefix independent convergence, BGP convergence depends on the IGP convergence, that's why we say, because next stop tracking is important. And another thing, I see IGP wait for BGP and I want to ask, did you do anything with the overload bit here in ISAS? Uh, yes, actually, yeah. we, uh, the overload bit is uh, no, in this specific service provider, no, we didn't uh, configure the uh, overload bit for other projects, yes, but for this one specifically, no. IGP wait for BGP, what what did you do there for that? 
Yeah, yeah I, I mean here we configure IGP weight for BGP, but we didn't configure the overload weight for ISIS. So when basically uh, when there is a failure and if on the node running IGP as well as BGP, it should be edge node anyway, because uh, in the core you have MPLS LDP, I think here because IGP LDP sync you are saying, when uh, you have yeah. LDP in the core, you don't run BGP in the core. So on the edge, it seems IGP wait for BGP. What does it mean uh, in case of uh, that device fails, the router fails, uh, and come back IGP before declaring that I can be used as a transit device, I can be used uh, to pass the traffic, BGP needs to be converged. When BGP is converged, BGP, there are many messages uh, especially BGP, uh, when it sees uh, BGP end of rip marker message, end of rip marker mean between the BGP neighbors that I received all the prefixes from you, then BGP this time informs IGP and it says, okay, now you can advertise uh, regular metric, regular cost, uh, so then it also joins to ISIS and then uh, receive the traffic. IGP wait for BGP in OSPF, uh, uh, also in a, it's there as a future. In ISIS, of course, it's there as well. Basically, why we are doing, in case of failure, we don't want to black hole the traffic. That's the reason. Yeah. Whatever implementation, which com configuration command, etc., we don't share, of course, those things. Why we are doing, uh, what it would pro provide for us, uh, do you need this one uh, in enterprise? There are many questions, huh? but uh, generally no, no. And what it provides, black hole avoidance, basically. I seen their LDP session protection as well as IGP, LDP synchronization feature in MPLS. Exactly same reason. We want to uh, avoid black holing in case of uh, failure. So protocols are synchronizing. IGP synchronized with BGP, IGP follows BGP. Now IGP will synchronize with LDP as well. IGP will wait LDP to, before the call before uh, advertising regular metric. Exactly. Yes, thank you, Orhan, actually, uh, uh, you nailed it. Exactly. Uh, so this is summarized BGP. Uh, actually, I saw, uh, while you were talking, I saw a question in the chat about BGP pick. So yes, uh, in this uh, project, there was BGP pick, but uh, I saw that there would be uh, too many uh, technologies to discuss today. So as uh, Orhan mentioned, Maybe uh, we will have another session talking about uh, another implementation where we have Sigma routing with uh, TI LFA, and we were having BGP uh, on top of Sigma routing, and we were uh, using the BGP pick. I believe it will be a very uh, interesting one, so um, we will talk about it in the upcoming session. Uh, just finally, to uh, wrap up, uh, also for MPLS itself, uh, we were using LDP, and as you can see, some of the feature here is just more like a control feature. It's, it's not actually a, a fast convergence yeah. feature, but it's something like a good practice. So usually, uh, if you have your network, and LDP by default will assign a label to every uh, prefix in the IGP. So as I mentioned, if ISIS has 4,000 routes, LDP will assign labels for all these 4,000 routes. This is not good. Even when LDP will converge, converge 4,000 uh, label and prefix, it will be, take more time than if it's uh, you're only converging 200 or 300 labels. So that's why don't put yourself in a problem, then try to solve it. Uh, put a good design. So from the first day, try to control uh, which the label which you will assign uh, which prefix will assign label for it and stick only to the uh, loopback slash 32 and also apply uh, which label you need to advertise and to, to receive. So some uh, some implementation like Cisco, you have maybe some allocate label and advertise label, some other uh, implementation in Juniper, you have even the uh, more control and assign, send, receive and, and very and so on. So this is one point you need to consider. Also, as Orhan mentioned, PFD, we can use it. Uh, also for LDP, you need to sync up with IGP because you rely on IGP, okay? And uh, the last, uh, one of the last point, if you have, uh, as example, okay, if you have your, uh, your device and you have multiple links, so you may configure something like 
uh, LDP session protection because you run maybe the LDP between the loopbacks and uh, to reach this loopback, you are using this interface. In case of this interface fail, you can check uh, another interface before declaring this LDP down. So LDP will check with underlying protocol how to reach my next hop or my neighbor LDP. And in case of failure, we will not declare the session down immediately, but we'll wait for uh, any protected uh, session, uh, protected oh, path yeah. to reach this neighbor. And the last point, we have something called LDP backup, which actually implemented the, I didn't, I didn't see it a lot, but for this uh, service provider we implemented. If you have also two neighbors, and let's say there is a, a link, one link, and this link is unstable, so it keeps uh, flapping up and down, up and down. So in order to avoid that each time the link flap, these two LDP neighbors will try to establish the session and then tear it down, Maybe after uh, two couple of times, you will inform these two neighbors just wait five to ten seconds before trying again to establish the session. This feature will add to the stability of your network, which, in, as I mentioned, sorry for that, it's what uh, mainly a service provider with most of the traffic was carried over label switches fast, label switches fast, LSP, and LDP is actually a key protocol to establish this LSP. For the left example, uh, LDP session protection, uh, if that top uh, path goes down, and if you are basically enabling, let's say, uh, LDP session between your loopbacks, uh, anyway, those loopbacks can be reachable via uh, bottom path, which is already up and running. Top just failed, so that's why you don't bring the LDP session down with the LDP session protection. LDP IGP sync though, uh, LDP session will go down, but the devices will continue, routers will continue to keep the label assignments because when it come back, IGP will converge faster than LDP and IGP will immediately update that you can use me as a transit router, but without label, you would black all the traffic again. So in order to prevent that, these are different approaches. LDP session protection and LDP IGP sync, though in the same network both of them could be used. Uh, probably I wouldn't uh, enable both of them at the same time, though. So LDP session protection and LDP uh, IGP sync uh, are used for black hole avoidance, same as IGP BGP uh, wait. IGP wait for BGP, also I ask overload bit, so basically IGP BGP synchronization you can call it, they didn't enable on this network. So uh, these are so good so far, uh, the, there was another question, uh, on behalf of Mohammed, I can answer, though I don't know this network, did you enable Adfet, no. he says, no, they wouldn't, because uh, in this network they have MPLS, and uh, if they would want to get the benefit, what you would get from Adfet, they would deploy unique RD per VRF per PE, uh, though uh, it doesn't mean AdPet doesn't work on top of MPLS network, of course it does, but you don't just need it. Just assign different mm -hmm. unique RD for the VRFs, for the VPN customers on different PEs, that's it. So you can get the you same can. advantages like uh, advertising multiple pets uh, or uh, you can, if you want to do multi-petting or if you want to avoid suboptimal routing or if you want to... Uh, avoid metal solution problems, etc. what you would get uh, from the adpad. Also, NHT is by default on correct. Yes, that's correct. Do you think session protection can sometimes can cause false positive as it's established targeted LDP? Good question. Might be, yes. So, any other uh, things that we will talk? Uh, I think that's it. Uh, just, uh, I like to, uh, as usual, let me see. Can you see my screen? Yep. Well, just to sum up, uh, some lesson learned. Uh, yeah, so there was a question that most of service providers will try to convert within 50 milliseconds. It's just something like legacy which we inherited. So don't go and implement it without uh, studying, studying and uh, analyzing the real application requirement and the SLA. So even some service provider and they have mobile customer and they are actually, uh, their uh, role is to convert maybe within 
second or 200 milliseconds and so on. So uh, design based on the requirements. So this is a very important point. The second point, how fast is fast? So what you consider uh, very fast conversions, maybe for other networks is not fast at all. So that's why you need also to agree with all the stakeholders, with the application owners, with the different business unit within the service provider, the internet business unit, the MPLS, I mean the VPN and so on, uh, defining how fast is this fast conversions for you. Uh, as I mentioned, in some situation, if you are having interoperability with other vendor or other, uh, even within the same vendor, but different hardware, hardware or different capabilities, you need to choose the minimum common denominator. Uh, sorry. Denominator, yeah, it's hard to say. <laughs> I'm a bit tired. It's almost <laughs> 10 p.m. here. So, as I mentioned, if you have one device support 50 milliseconds or 15 milliseconds as a BFD, keep alive, but the other device only support up to 100 milliseconds, you need to go with the lowest. Even if you configure one, one with them with 15, we will negotiate and decide which one is the best. But from design perspective, consider this limitation into your design. And some, somehow, not related to fast convergence, but related to the overall design as a whole, when you consider your uh, redundancy and resiliency, and in case of failure, you need to plan, uh, in case of failure, will this affect your traffic? Will it be deterministic? Are you, do, do you, are you aware of what will happen in case of failure? As example, the traffic will go to another country or another state, uh, affecting your international links. So all this you need to also include while thinking about the uh, fast convergence. Uh, once again, I want to say thank you all and uh, thank Orhan for uh, this initiative. Actually, it's very uh, great, it's very uh, good from him and to help the community. And thank you again, Orhan, and everyone. Thank you for joining again, Mohammed. Uh, guys, uh, hopefully it was nice and useful. We will continue the sessions with Mohammed, with the other industry experts as well. Uh, yesterday I published the IXP video, Internet Exchange Point Real Life. Today we just uh, recorded the service provider, not this time Internet Exchange Point, but this time Internet Service Provider Real Life Design. It's from, we look at from uh, convergence aspect we used, we talked about some timers from IGP point of view, BGP, MPLS, multiple layers, what we did, etc. defined here. It was, uh, I think, nice and not that lengthy session. So uh, hopefully you start from the beginning and finish till end. If you have any question uh, below this video, please, uh, in the comment section, you can ask. Uh, we will be answering your questions if you like the video uh, if you find found it useful please like it comment it and don't forget to subscribe to channel as well we will continue the sessions if you uh, just like it and if you find it useful how we will understand if you find it useful just liking or commenting uh, if uh, really this service provider uh, real life design stuff you think that's there are so many things already there. People are already talking, uh, the real life design, etc. Or somehow, if you are not interested, don't. But if you are interested, like it. So we can continue with the Mohammed and other people also. I can understand the service provider design, what people are interested with. We can continue. Uh, so here I am seeing lots of feedback, but uh, I want to see them when we published on uh, YouTube, especially. Right there. Hopefully you, you also write yes, because uh, we will be monitoring all those comments, etc. So if it's really uh, useful, we should continue in this way. We say, uh, okay, ISP, they are interested. IXP, they are interested. Data center, they are interested. We can understand what are their interests really and try to be more useful on that space. That's the whole reason. We were planning enterprises as well with Mohammed, but uh, we said, okay, may, let's start with the service provider first and uh, let's see what will happen. Uh, basically, put uh, your comment, like the video, and uh, subscribe for getting a notification. Uh, you can reach us both. We are using uh, LinkedIn, Mohamed Radwan. You can see our names here, by the way, Orhan Ergin. You can follow us also on LinkedIn, guys. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Mohamed, again. Yeah, thank you, Orhan. Thank you, everyone.
Thanks for that, friends. Okay. And uh, have a good day. Stay safe. You too. You too. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye.